Hello, and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host, Rob. In today's video, we're going to be finishing off my Broken Lands campaign review. This is going to be part four of four, or five of five, I guess, if you include the part zero. Or uh, maybe part five of four, if we just want to be as confusing as possible. Whatever. Anyways, quick recap. Uh, in the last episode, the party uh, met up with Xiao Ling and helped her complete her kind of side quest of helping her uh, go back, go down into the land of death. They retrieved the souls of her husband and her son, restored them back to life again, escaped. They then um, end up uh, going to White Spire, and from there they end up going up north, helping a bunch of dwarves fight an army of giants. And in return, Eldon is given a, uh, a pistol and a long armor. Eldon, of course, is our halfling rogue, just to quickly call that. And uh, the dwarves in my game, some of the dwarves have like guns, you know, like old style, you know, muskets and flintlock pistol types. So uh, they reward him with uh, one of each and teach him how to like maintain them and use them and whatnot. And then Seven, the artificer, decides to uh, try to enchant them. He was infusing one of them originally with one of his infusions, but you know, he needed those for himself, of course, you know, I mean, gotta have priorities. So they just decided to take even more downtime and uh, create magical versions of those guns. <laughs> Uh, downtime, the campaign. Anyways, um, at this point, the party returns back to White Spire again after spending heaven only knows how much time with the dwarves creating magical weapons. That, you know, takes a while, as we've learned. Um, from there, they meet up with uh, Kenosha again, the high priestess of Mishnek, the goddess of divination and prophecy. And she tells them uh, but the next part of their mission where they need to go to the city of Sigil. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Sigil, basically Sigil is called the City of Doors or the City of Keys sometimes, or the, even the City of Gates. It has lots of names. But anyways, it has um, the city where basically it has doorways or portals that lead to basically every plane in the multiverse, essentially, right? And uh, what makes Sigil unique and interesting is that no gods can actually enter there. Is protected by something called the Lady of Pain, who apparently is even beyond the power of the gods. And if any of them try entering, they just, you know, seem to get destroyed, as far as we know. So, anyways, the party goes to Sigil, and uh, there they meet up with the half orc, Murren. And Murren was my friend Cody's character from a campaign I'd run earlier. So, when we first started playing 5th edition, uh, a different friend of ours, George, was actually running the first campaign we were all part of. And like I said, we've played, you know, other editions in the past, right? But this was specifically fifth edition when we started playing it. And he started us with the Lost, Lost Minds of Fandalar. And uh, from there, he just kind of ran his own stuff. But George ended up having to uh, move away. He went back out east. And we kind of stopped playing even before that, actually. But once he moved, it was, you know, over and done with, essentially. And um, so... We played some other stuff. We did like Lost Things, uh, King's Thunder or whatever it's called. And um, then I decided to run a Ravenloft campaign. So we just did like Curse of Strahd, of course. And uh, or I guess it's over there actually, sorry. Anyways, and uh, so I ran, ran that. And in the meantime, I'd been developing like a Lovecraftian horror type story, which I thought would be a really great place to go once we'd finish Tumo or uh, the Curse of Strahd. Cause we had like the gothic horror and then we were going to do like, you know, Lovecraftian horror, right? And so that was the campaign that we did there at that point. And that one, we actually got to like level 18 and never made it to 20. But I followed that up eventually with a different campaign for 18, 19, and 20, which finally got some of those guys there. But anyways, so that was the King in Yellow. And our friend Cody, who can no longer play with us because everybody's shifts have all been moved around and now he's on night shift, unfortunately. But he played a half-orc warlock named Murren. So I talked to Cody and said, hey, would it be all right if I used Murren as an NPC in this campaign? And kind of like introduced him and kind of had this like sort of side quest with him. And one of the things the players had done in that campaign is that at one point, they'd gone to the city of Sigil and they'd met this NPC called the Beggar King. And the Beggar King was like uh, this... He had, like, leprosy, but he had this, like, army of beggars that all, like, followed him and stuff. 
and his voice was like kind of half destroyed. He only had like three fingers on one hand and a couple fingers on the other hand. And um, he had this like mind flayer who would like read his thoughts and then like project them to everybody else. And they just called him the speaker, even though the mind flayer didn't speak either, right? He just telepathically let everybody know what the beggar king was thinking. And one of the things the beggar king had was uh, a key to like open this passage into like the realm of Dendar, the night serpent, right? Which is what the players wanted to do. And so the beggar king makes this deal with them. He wants them to retrieve uh, this like mummified hand for him because he wants to replace like his two fingered hand with this mummified hand, which also is missing a finger or two as it turns out, but eh, not a big deal. Anyways, the party uh, manages to do that. And of course, some of the party members suspected, but you know, they had their own priorities at that point. But of course, this mummified hand is the hand of Vecna. Now, after that campaign ended, I actually did like a little like epilogue where I just kind of like typed out this little brief like three paragraph or four paragraph story. And basically, this um, assassin gets lured into this uh, place to try to kill someone, but she realizes that the trap and she gets attacked by some like disheveled looking leprous beggar and a mind flayer and they manage to kill her and rip out her eye and then the beggar removes his own eye and sticks her eye in his place because of course she has the eye of Vecna and so I kind of had this idea that maybe the beggar king would like ascend and become the new Vecna like Vecna reborn type of thing right and he's not quite the original Vecna so he's maybe not quite as powerful but that was kind of the whole idea and I'd never gotten to do that so I thought why not work that into this campaign and Murren can be the guy that like can like join up with the party briefly and help them out and so you know just kind of like how Zhao Ling had had her like little episode at the party and then Ash had had her episode at the party Murren would have his episode at the party now and so it was just kind of this rotating door of NPCs joining doing their like own side quest with the party and then just leaving right but I thought it was kind of a neat idea anyways so um they end up joining up with Morin, and they go to try to uh, confront Vecna. At this point, though, um, it was pretty funny because Krogel finally manages to complete the Daemonomicon of Igwil, something he's gotten a couple pieces of here and there, but now he's finally got the whole thing assembled. And the Daemon Omicron uh, has a bunch of like names of like angels and demons and uh, devils and whatnot that you can like summon and bind and stuff mostly on the infernal fiend side not as much on the angelic side but it has a couple of those too and anyways uh, this is from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything it was one of the artifacts that was added but anyways um, one of the only well not one of the only drawbacks but one of the major drawbacks of the tome is that if you ever uh, take a long rest on the same plane of existence as the Daemon Omicron, you have to make a saving throw or you could be possessed by one of the fiends from the book. So Krogel, uh, because Mike had, you know, read the description in the book and knew out of game knowledge, uh, he decides he's going to take a precaution. So he gets the Demiplane spell and he manages to, uh, I can't remember if he found it or bought it or what he did. I think he might have purchased it actually. And so he like scribes it into a spell book. But he has to take a long rest before he can actually have the spell prepared. So that means there's going to be one long rest in which Demi Plane is not prepared and which he could possibly be possessed before he'll have this, the Demi Plane spell and then he can destroy the book in the Demi Plane every night, right? And wouldn't you know it, he bombs the saving throw and gets possessed. So the party's all getting ready in the morning and all of a sudden Krogel goes all like Gollum with the one ring and he's clutching the Daemon Onicron and all of a sudden he just like turns to the party, right? And he like casts a force cage on the party's paladin to try to like lock her down and then he casts like a maze spell on the rogue because those were like the two kind of big damage dealers in the party. Uh, mostly because everybody else said damage sucks. But uh, anyways, um... And sure enough, so the party fighting him, the rogue, against all odds, needs like an 18 or better, but of course it's Troy rolling, but he only needs like an 18 or, 20 or better, I think, to pass his like intelligence check to find his way out of the maze. 
immediately rolls like an 18 and finds a way out the next round and is able to help the party again. But they so they managed to like kill Krogel and then have to resurrect him again. And uh, but it was Mike was actually pretty happy too because uh, between his like Krogel's an abjurer, so between his abjuration shield and he had some sort of like summon demon. Like at this point, once he gets a Damon Omicron and he's able to start casting things like Magic Circle with uh, using a ninth level spell slot and stuff, um, he starts going all in on just summoning fiends like crazy and then just binding them all and stuff, right? So I think Mike had this idea that he was just going to bring his demon army with him everywhere, but I really didn't, A, I didn't want that to happen, and B, like, I mean, it's really time consuming when a guy has to, like, run something besides his own character, but if he's running, like, 12 demons plus his character, that's going to be ridiculous. Plus, it kind of overshadows the rest of the party, which I don't want. So I was like, okay, you can have like your stable of demons and devils or whatever else. And then on each particular mission, you can like kick them in your demiplane if you want, right? Or whatever. And then on each particular mission, you can bring like one of them with you, right? So we, we reached that as a compromise. And Mike was pretty happy with it too, because he did start getting some pretty powerful fiends, especially once he had the gate spell, because then he could like magic circle and he could gate them right into there. And then he could try to bind them and stuff. And he had the true name in the Demon Omicron of someone like Merilith. So he ends up binding her, and then she, you know, Marilis is just an absolute combat machines. So, I mean, that was also terrible, by the way, because she has, like, seven attacks around. So then Krogel would be like, I firebolt! It's like, oh, yeah, good, you did, like, 18 damage. Nice job for your 19th level wizard. Oh, but now the Marilis attacks, and you're like, oh, I forgot about her. And then it's just, like, rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. And she's, like, wrapping this guy up in the tail, and then she's teleporting. And, she's, and you're just like, oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> But whatever, I, I do like summoning playstyles, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to let the players go wild, but I also don't want to, like, put really, like, artificial restraints on them, and say, like, no, I'm not going to let you play the summoner that you wanted to play and stuff, because I really hate that kind of stuff. I think it is possible to look at your adventure and say, okay, they are going to have a Merilith with them, so maybe I need to scale things up slightly, <laughs> you know? And then the player still gets to do what he wanted to do, but it doesn't necessarily have to destroy your adventure. It is more work as a dungeon master to do that kind of stuff, which can be annoying sometimes. But I also am really big on letting the players, you know, fulfill the vision of their character and not like put artificial restraints on it that don't need to be there. But like I said, on the other hand, if Mike's bringing 50 demons with him, then that's not gonna be any fun for anybody, especially the rest of the party. And that's also a very important consideration, right? So you kind of need to find that balance somewhere. Anyways, so they managed to kill Krogel and then resurrect him again. Uh, we then had a good laugh because I remembered at this point that actually uh, Murren had the spell Debbie Plane and so none of this was necessary. It all could have been avoided. Uh, hilarious. But anyways... Uh, uh, the party go after Vecna, so they go to this, like, temple, they fight through all the different guards and stuff, and, um, I've relayed this part of the story before as well, but at some point they fight this creature called a Skyn Witch, or Skeen Witch, whoever it's pronounced, and I just chose them because they were interesting creatures, I thought, with kind of a unique ability, and one of the abilities they had was that when they activate it, every player in the game has to write down the level and method that they think the player to their left is going to die. <laughs> and if they are correct, then if that player dies under those circumstances and at that correct level, they are instantly resurrected as with a true resurrection spell, restoring all their hit points, spell slots, everything. Um, I, I just thought it was kind of a cool mechanic. I thought it would be kind of fun. So they end up being the Sky and Witch. But, uh, most people just wrote down stupid stuff. However, uh, of course, Troy, ever the strategist, his player to the left was Seven, played by Jaden, the Artificer. And he thinks, well, we're going to be fighting Vecna right away, so maybe he'll die fighting Vecna. And then he's like, well, maybe I need to be more specific. So he writes that he's going to die at their current level to one of Vecna's spells. And then Jaden, just by pure luck, guy playing seven, uh, 
Diza the Paladin was the player to his left, and he just wrote that she was going to die to friendly fire. And that was mostly because, uh, so Jade and uh, so Seven, the player who plays Diza is Trish, who is actually Jaden's mom. And the two of them have like this running joke where they're constantly trying to like accidentally injure each other in combat a lot. It kind of started with Trish casting Shatter on, on party members as well as the enemies. But then in the White Spar campaign, I kind of house ruled where anytime you attacked with advantage or disadvantage and you got double ones, you'd have some sort of catastrophic crit. It kind of goes back to the old idea of like the mishaps and fumbles and stuff. But personally, I think that just having a fumble on a one is just way too common and just kind of, I don't know, I don't, I don't really like it. Especially by the time your character's like level 20, it doesn't make sense that 5% of the time you're dropping your weapon or hitting a teammate, like, you know, that's ridiculous. But I thought, if you double one on the same attack roll, that can only happen if you have advantage or disadvantage, and it requires double ones. That's very rare, but it's also kind of cool, and it's just something kind of fun, right? And it actually started because one of the play or one of the NPCs the players were fighting at one point rolled double ones when attacking somebody with disadvantage, and I just thought it'd be funny if he hit his own ally. What I hadn't counted on was that Crag, due to Reckless Attack, would go on to roll double ones like six or seven times during the course of that campaign. And the only other person usually in melee combat with, near him was his mother, the paladin from that campaign. And so he just kept hitting his mom a lot. Now eventually I decided it wasn't fair for him to just auto hit her, because at that point she had like 26 armor class or something. So I, I forced him to like make attack rolls in order to hit her if he got double ones, just to you know make things a little more fair for her. But either way, it kind of began this like running joke where the two of them were always kind of like trying to find excuses to like accidentally injure each other, right? So just as a joke, he writes that she's gonna die due to friendly fire. So basically, that game session ends as they get to Vecna. So we leave off the, on the cliffhanger, they're about to fight Vecna. But of course, this gives Troy an entire week to strategize. And so Troy decides to convince Jaden, you, should try to help me kill your mom fighting Vecna after she's dropped all of her spell slots on smites. Because she's a paladin, she's going to be smiting Vecna, Vecna's not dead, she's going to be doing a ton of damage, but then she's going to run out of spell slots. But if we kill her, she's going to be resurrected with full health and all of her spell slots back. And in fact, uh, you should probably help me make sure that you die due to Vecna's spell damage as well. And so, we have the big fight. And it's kind of funny because I think a few of the party members um, really thought the fight was going to be kind of a pushover, right? I mean, they knew Vecna was powerful, but they didn't really know how powerful he was going to be. And don't forget, they've got this Merylith demon with them. They've got Murren, the uh, warlock with them, who's, you know, not terrible. Um, <laughs> sorry, Cody. Uh, you know, he's got Elvis Blast. He's got 20 Charisma. Uh, he does have a tome to raise his charisma, but he still has 80 more years before the cooldowns run out and he can use it himself, because somebody else had already used it. So, you know, 80 more years, but he is immortal, so it doesn't really matter to him. He's an uh, undying warlock, I think. But anyways, so we get into the big fight, and I kind of based my Vecna oops, off of um, what I could find online about the version of Vecna that Matt Mercer used on Critical Role, because Vecna was like the big bad at the end of season one of Critical Role. And I basically based mine off, off of his, more or less. And I think I changed a few things, but uh, he had a lot of legendary saving throws, I think like seven or so, and he had a lot of legendary actions, and so he was able to cast spells as legendary actions and stuff, and he had a ton of hit points. And for his ninth little spell, I decided to give him, I didn't like, want to give him like Meteor Storm or something like that, but I gave him um, Blade of Disaster. And it turns out that when you have legendary saving throws, that you will basically never ever fail a concentration saving throw, ever, until you're out of legendary saves. Uh, there were times, like I remember once Trish the Paladin Diza, she ends up critting Vecna, drops like her highest level uh, smite on him, and 
just like rules like off. I think she had like a couple of twos or threes in there, but it's almost all fives and above, right? Just does a truckload of damage to him. And Vecna has like a DC like 35 or 36 concentration saving throw. Rolls like a three, and everybody's like, yeah! And it's like, eh, well, actually he uses a little legendary save. And they're like, no! <laughs> and sure enough, the, I don't know what was going on with the Black Blade of Disaster here, but it crits on an 18, 19, or 20, and it normally does four die 12, force damage, but it specifically says on a crit, it does triple damage instead of double, doing 12 tight, 12 force damage. And he wants to crit like every other round with this thing. So at one point, uh, they do end up having to kill Trish, because Vecna ends up putting her down with a black blade of disaster. So the paladin goes down, she's unconscious, making death saving throws. And so the party members, uh, kill her while she's lying down on the ground, making her death saving throws. And uh, she was quite upset about it at the time, too, because she's like, ah, and they're trying to explain, no, no, it's okay. Like, this is how he said you'll come back to life. You know, we already know that that's the mechanic here. If you die a friendly fire, you come back to life. You know, so we got to finish you off now. And, but she, she was not having any part of it. But she was also unconscious, bleeding all over the ground, so there was very little she could do about it. Uh, <laughs> so that was pretty funny. So sure enough, the party does kill her in the middle of the fight, and then she like comes back to life again, right? Uh, killing Seven the Artificer with Vecna's spells proved to be much more difficult, because um, this was a case where he does take a lot of damage from Vecna, but Elden just starts like using sneak attacks on the Artificer in order to try to put him down. So at one point, uh, Seven is already getting low on health. The fight's not going too good. Vecna is like critting everybody apparently while still casting spells and doing everything else, you know. And um, the party's just taking tons of damage here. And so like Elden ends up like uh, sneak attacking uh, Seven the one turn and does a bunch of damage. And the next turn, the closely is gonna do the same thing. And of course, he rolls a natural 20 and nearly kills Seven outright because so Seven is so low on health at this point. But it turns out he's still alive. He's also unconscious. And then, um, mostly just to kind of help the party out. But I thought it'd be kind of fun as well. I decided to have Vecna cast like Circle of Death or Chain Lightning or something like that. And just hit everybody in the party with that. And uh, so of course, Seven ends up dying from that. And he too is brought back to life. But as it is, like the fight, if it wasn't for the Sky Witch, like the party might have lost. Like I think, I was so worried that between the uh, between Murren and the Myrolith being there, that Vecna was just gonna like go down like a clown, and that there was gonna be like no challenge at all. That um, that did not happen. <laughs> he he lived up to his uh, legendary reputation, that is for sure. So um, the party finally managed to win. The fight was so long. Now, granted, we did start late this day because we had, like, supper and stuff. So we, we only got in a couple hours of gaming on that day. But the entire game session was just the fight with Vecna. And, uh, but the party does manage to defeat him. And so everybody's pretty happy. And uh, Morin's glad that he's kind of atoned for helping to, you know, recreate Vecna in the first place. Um, and, you know, he, he ends up going his own separate way again. And uh, the party um, returned back to White Spire. And at this point, they end up meeting, oh, we also have Ari, I forgot Ari. Ari just basically cast nothing but healing spells the entire fight, and people were still dropping like crazy, Ari the Druid. Uh, she's like casting, like heal, and you know, stores like 60 or 70 health to the person. And then they took like 100 points and they go down. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, ah, ah, heal this guy. It's because she's about to heal the paladin. And everybody's like, no, 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 don't heal the paladin. We need to kill her. She'll come back to full health, you know? So then she's like healing somebody else. And then that guy like ends up going down. And she's like, can I heal them? They're like, yeah, heal that person. They're going to die. And she's like, but the paladin. They're like, no, the paladin's fine. Don't heal the paladin. Heal the new guy who's dying. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just ended up being like, I keep dropping my notes here. But anyways, it just ended up being like a pretty funny but long combat session. But it was still a pretty fun game. Anyways, they, so um, at this point, the party knows that the last thing they need to do is to... Uh, they're, they're looking for Zardat and the Mouse King. But of course, Zardat is there in Whitespire. And so Zardat kind of uh, relays to them 
uh, everything she's been able to piece together over what was supposed to be the past seven years, but at this point it's like, you know, 12 or 13 years or whatever it's been, right? And she tells them that uh, when Magnus um, first, like when the party defeats the, uh, the Dread One in the White Spire campaign, and Magnus decides he wants to basically become the new Dread One, so he like moves into the Dread One Citadel, banishes the rest of the party with his wish spell so they can't interfere because he's kind of worried that they're going to bring him down. And um, the Dread One is somebody that I kind of took from Monty, Cook, Monty Cook's Tallest uh, campaign. And he was, I don't remember a lot about him anymore because it's been a while. And my version of the Dread One was kind of like loosely based on that, but I took him in a lot of different places. So my version of the Dread One, though, is basically that he is the avatar of this one moon god. And so sorry that kind of relays how... Right now in the Nine, the pantheon of uh, this particular area, and kind of the main pantheon of my world, even though there are other gods as well, um, you have Shara, who's the goddess of the sun, and life and childbearing and all that kind of stuff. Her husband, Anun, who is the beast lord, and is kind of like the nature god, right? Although Shara is kind of like crops, he's more like plants, like real plants, trees, animals, that kind of stuff. And they have a daughter, named Selene, who is the goddess of the moon and magic and that kind of stuff, right? But they also had another son, and she explains to them how this son, uh, who is basically the, uh, related to something called the Valis Moon, and the Valis Moon was kind of part of the White Spire campaign, and it's kind of like this evil omen, it's like this moon that has some weird orbit that just kind of appears every now and then. It doesn't seem to be in any sort of pattern either, which, you know, makes you realize that it's probably not an orbit, actually. And, uh, I think his name was Mawad... Mawabin or something? Mawabin? I can't, I can't remember. Terrible when you get the name of your own gods. I think it's Mawabin. Mawabin. Uh, whatever. I'll figure it out, and then I'll put it on the screen for people to read. But anyways, we'll just call him the, the moon god. The exiled moon god. So anyways, he attempts to murder Selene at some point, and is banished completely, right? And uh, this is like way in the way in antiquity, right? And uh, but every now and then he manages to like return again, which is when the Valis Moon appears in the sky, and he like returns. And the Dread One is kind of like his physical avatar here on this plane, right? And uh, the reason is because he has a couple different artifacts that were associated with the Dread One. So the original Dread One in Monty Cook's Tallest, he was this like powerful cleric who was like lawful good, and him and his companions were like the great heroes of their age. And they defeated all these like ancient evils and stuff like that, and gathered all these like evil artifacts and stuff, and kind of like locked them all away so that nobody could use them. However, over time these evil artifacts, some of which were sentient, began to influence the man who had later become the Dread One, and turn him to the dark side essentially. And so eventually the Dread One uh, turns against somebody else, uh, murders a bunch of his former companions and friends, and he actually wants to try to destroy the gods. And his plan is because the gods draw their power from their worshippers, he essentially wants to murder all the mortal worshippers in the entire plane, which will rob the gods of nearly all their power and allow him to defeat them. And at this point he's kind of in, a, in allegiance or an alliance with some sort of like other ancient beings, right? That are not actually gods. Now, I think originally they were supposed to be some sort of like demon lords or something, but in mind I just made it the far realm because I thought that'd be kind of more interesting. And so what I decided was these sentient artifacts were actually beings from the far realm, but here in our plane they'd kind of been forced into like other forms, right? And so they're basically essentially like these living things, but they're trapped in these physical objects that can't really move around or do anything else. But they have very powerful will, and they were able to tempt uh, the original Dread One, of course, and uh, eventually his like soul gets like sucked out of his body and imprisoned in this thing called the Soul Cage, uh, which the party had actually found in the White Spire campaign, and it was occupied by somebody called Gull the Half-God, who was this like necromancer, lich, demigod type of guy, who had tried to become the Dread One as well. And he'd managed to like penetrate into the Dread One's fortress and then had never been seen again. And so the party actually find the soul cage and they realize when they try talking to this thing in it that this like disembodied spirit is Gull the Half-God. So they just leave him there, which was probably wise. 
Uh, anyways, they ended up going on defeating the Dreadmon, like I say, but they didn't really do anything about the artifacts. And so I figured that Magnus was going to have the same problem. And so he is going to be corrupted by, uh, by these artifacts and is going to become the new avatar of the moon god, uh, Mao Bin, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I keep getting confused with like Mao, or no, yeah, with Mao Deep. I keep getting confused with, with the name for Paul Atreides from Dune. That's why I can't get it straight in my head. Sorry. Anyways, um, Moon God. So uh, that's what I thought was going to happen, right? And I decided that when when um, Magnus exiled the party, he actually exiles them to the Far Realm. And so Zardak kind of relays all the stuff that she has learned and figured out. And she also tells the party that she's retrieved somebody who think, who can kind of navigate the Far Realm and can help them get back the old party. And she reveals the Mouse King. And the Mouse King is one of the animal lords from, eh, wherever it is, from uh, the Creature Codex. And uh, basically he's just this, like, mouse who's like, you know, three feet tall or whatever, and he's commands the mice and he can speak to mice. He can also like shapeshift into a regular mouse. Uh, but he looks like, you know, he's got like the hat with the feather around it. He's got like this rapier and stuff and a cloak and whatnot and clothes. And, uh, you know, just this giant mouse guy. And, um, but he also is very sneaky and stuff, right? So the party team up with him and, uh, and with Zardat originally. And Zardat takes them to this temple, which the party from Whitespire had gone to her, with her to before. So if you watch my Whitespire campaign, you'll remember she ends up taking them to this place called uh, the Pattern Room, right? And I kind of stole this idea from the Chronicles of Amber, right? So basically, in my cosmology that I've kind of created for myself, I have this thing just, just called, like, the Loom, and it's basically, like, just this combination of, like, a loom, like, weaving stuff, right? Combined with like a supercomputer. And it just calculates all these different probabilities and possibilities and other variables. And from that, it creates like some sort of realm of existence, right? So that could be the world of Greyhawk. And another one might be the Forgotten Realms. And another one will be my campaign world. And, you know, whatever, right? And it just keeps creating all these different things based on all these different variables. And so this was kind of my creation of a multiverse, essentially, right? And so on the one end, and like the loom is kind of outside of creation, essentially, right? Because it's creating all these things, but it's kind of like outside and removed from it. And this is what Zardat actually worships. She calls it the Celestial Machine. And she is actually a warlock, but that's who her patron is, is the Celestial Machine, the loom, right? But then opposed to the loom, also outside of creation, is the Far Realm, which is like this completely other thing, right? And, I, and so in my cosmology... The beings of the Far Realm, which are kind of like your real, like, Lovecraftian horror-type creatures in a lot of cases. Uh, but, you know, the Far Realm is actually something from, like, the D&D mythos, right? And uh, a lot of, like, things like aboliths and stuff are rumored to have come from there at one point. And a lot of these other, like, weird aberration-type creatures are kind of from there. And some of them are like super powerful, like Cthulhu, Haster type levels, right? Or even beyond them, maybe. And some of them are like really, really weak and pathetic, right? It's kind of like devils. You could have a, like a Lemire or you could have like Asmodeus, you know? And everything in between, right? Um, but anyway, so my party had never done anything with the Far Realm. I'd never really done anything with it. So I did a bunch of research on it beforehand, of course, which is where I came up with a lot of these ideas. And I just thought it'd be kind of cool, right? So... They go to uh, this ancient temple, which was once uh, the temple of the Celestial Machine. But now, like, the only person who still serves the Celestial Machine really is Zardat at this point, right? Although it's not entirely true, there are some others. But the only one that we've ever met in my campaign world to this point, right, is Zardat. And, uh, like I said, kind of like the Chronicles of Amber, the idea is that anybody in service of the machine can, like, navigate this pattern... And once they uh, get to the center, they basically can transport themselves to anywhere uh, they want, right? Because they're now like kind of like one with the 
celestial machine, and since the celestial machines created basically everything, they can now like go to any of those places, right? Um, so the party by themselves can't really do it, but if Sardat leads them through, they can like follow in her footsteps and they can get there. And the White Spire characters did this at one point because that was actually how they teleported themselves from uh, Kem back to White Spire again. But Zardat wants to use that now to go to like this like breach between like our universe and the Far Realm. And uh, this breach is basically caused by uh, by the good old Moon God reappearing again. And oh yeah, so I also missed one part of the story. One of the things with the Moon God is when he was exiled, he actually ends up like tearing through the boundary between this universe and the Far Realm. And uh, the uh, really powerful entities of the Far Realm kind of like break him down and destroy him and rebuild him and he kind of like becomes their servant. Which is why we now have this connection between the Valis Moon, the Moon God, and the Far Realm, and why his uh, his um, avatar has these like artifacts of the Far, far Realm, right? It's because he's now a servant of the Far Realm, and this is one of the reasons why he hates all the other gods, as if he didn't have a reason enough after being exiled, right? Although it is his own fault. He went crazy and attempted to, you know, kill his sister, so, you know, what do you expect? Um, but anyways, so the idea is that, uh, Zardat's going to try to like hold this like gateway open as the party goes through and that they're going to have to navigate the far realm, find their other characters and come back, right? And so with the Most King's help though, because the Most King has been to the far realm, the Most King's also kind of insane at this point. So you have to cast like restoration type spells on him. Uh, eventually they use a greater restoration though, which does cure his insanity. So that's good. But up till now they've only had low level one. So they've had to keep recasting them all the time. And Zardat doesn't really have restoration. She's a warlock, right? So they've had limited tools to try to keep the poor guy sane and healthy. But anyways, so he leads them party through. They end up fighting these creatures that uh, are called the Shoth. And uh, it ends up being a pretty intense fight. But they see, like, um, all these, like, almost like crystal, like, caskets or coffins and stuff, right? And they can sort of see, like just sort of like images or shapes inside them and they can't make anything out, right? So eventually the, the fight ends up being like pretty rough and these things have an annoying ability where if you deal like lethal damage, they actually split and become two versions with half health. Although the versions, once they've split, they can only split the once they can't keep splitting, right? Uh, but the, the big like leader, he can actually absorb all the little ones into himself which destroys them, but heals him for however many hit points they had remaining. So the fight ends up being like pretty brutal, but of course the party ends up succeeding and they win. And then the whole place begins like kind of collapsing because really the place is kind of like made out of the leader as well, kind of. He's just this huge amorphous blob entity creature thing. And, uh, oh, I also forgot to mention, on the way in the party does end up seeing uh, they see like different things moving through the far realm, but one of the things they see is this like weird looking like jellyfish type creature that's like the size of like an entire city. I told them it was roughly the size of Calgary, but if you're not here in Canada, you probably don't know how big Calgary is. Uh, but you might know how bad your hockey team is, so that might have reached you, so you never know. Um, anyways, that'll be relevant later though, that's why I mention now. So, at first I want to try to open, open the coffins, but I, I, I just start describing how everything is like collapsing and, te and falling in, and they're just like, ah, just grab the coffins and go, right? So they're all, uh, they all grab their coffins and they're like kind of like swimming through the void, essentially. And uh, they see like the, what used to be this huge pillar of light where the gateway was that Zardat was holding open. It's now like this little tiny pinprick of energy, and they're like, oh, go, go, everybody, everybody. Uh, but they managed to get back in time and I kind of had like a counter, so as long as it, they didn't spend like more than, I think it was like, however many rounds of combat or whatever it was, then things were going to be okay. And it was pretty close. They had like, I think, one round left or two rounds left. They were, they were down to a round or two of combat. But they did manage to make it back, and I did not have to cheat for them. They legitimately made it back on their own. And uh, so they come back through, and at this point, they managed to like open the coffins, and of course... It's their player characters from the White Spire campaign. So at this point, uh, all the different players are going to be playing their new character from the Broken Lands campaign, as well as 
their previous character from the White Spire campaign. And so this was kind of building up to my hopefully big epic conclusion where both parties would be united and we were going to have to go up against the moon god and try to destroy him. But first things first, the party ends up, uh, oh, oh no, no, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, so they end up entering into like the citadel of the dragon, right? And uh, most stuff in there is dead because the guys from White Spire killed everything. But they reach the soul cage, which used to have Gull the Half God. But instead, the uh, disembodied spirit thing inside identifies itself as Magnus Cain. So basically, he's like fed on the soul of Gull, and now Magnus is like inhabited the soul cage. Although eventually, he'll like feed on Magnus too if they don't rescue him, kind of thing, right? So. The party kind of realized, oh, well, we probably need a body for Magnus. So they ended up having to go. They ended up fighting the Dread One again. Although this time it's a little easier. They have a, a few more people to help them. And so they managed to defeat him. And uh, they open up the soul cage. And Magnus is able to return back to his own body again, right? So at this point, we've had a lot of player deaths and a lot of player resurrections throughout this campaign of various different methods. But uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so... At this point, I knew I wanted to have uh, these two like big missions, essentially, right? Because I had the two artifacts. So the idea is that now the Dread One's uh, avatar thing has been destroyed. They, they need to fight the actual moon god himself, and they need to destroy these two artifacts, which are actually, as I said, sentient beings from the Far Realm. And they both need to be destroyed simultaneously, almost, right? So what I told the party was both artifacts need to be destroyed in the same round of combat. And um, one they have to take into the midst of Baphomet's uh, labyrinth in the abyss, and the other one they have to take to Mount Celestia in the Seven Heavens. And so basically we get this uh, mission where the two parties uh, have to split again, and so the one group, uh, which was like Crag and most of the original guys, they go to the Seven Heavens, and the other group goes to the Abyss, which is mostly our Broken Lands guys, right? And so the Abyss group end up meeting Baphomet, although Baphomet actually ends up kind of helping them out, not really helping them, but he doesn't want these things to, you know, return either, right? Like, once he realizes what's happening, like, he thinks the party's brought this thing from the Far Realm there to, like, try to challenge him or destroy his power, potentially, but when he realizes the party's trying to destroy it, then he's like, uh, yeah, they can, let them do it, you know? So, but anyways, they end up fighting, um, I think they're called the Olvu one or something like that, or Olvu one. They're like CR 27 or 29 creatures. Uh, they are no joke, right? And then I also took from the Tome of Beast 2, I took some of the new like Demon Lord type creatures, some, which, were, which were like really weird and bizarre. Like the most, like the least Demon Lord and the most like Cthulhu wish that I could find. And uh, gave those things, uh, used those for stats as well for some of the like lesser beings that were trying to help these things. So of course we get our two big fights, and they're both kind of happening simultaneously. So it's kind of like a round of combat with the one group, and then a round of combat with the other group was what I was planning on doing. Um, but it kind of turned into just a lot of combat, and things kind of broke down a bit. This was like another night of just, you know. 30 minutes of like role play and stuff, a couple combat scenarios with, and some exploration, and then three hours of fighting, which was not not great, to be honest. It was a little discouraging because I had this idea of this big epic conclusion in my mind where it's going to be like, yeah, we're going to split the party and both parties are going to have to fight these things and it's going to happen simultaneously and blah, blah, blah. And then it, you realize that it's just nothing but dice rolling in combat for the rest of the night. Uh, but there was some great moments, though. Um, among the others was uh, Bahamut and uh, some, of, some of the other gods of uh, Mount Celestia coming to help the party. And uh, so while the party's fighting the one artifact thing, uh, basically, like, it, like, tears open this rift straight into the Far Realm. And wouldn't you know it, what comes from the Far Realm, but some sort of weird jellyfish creature that's roughly the size of Calgary. And so, like... Bahamut's just like, you must deal with this one, and we will deal with the greater threat. So, you know, now the party gets to fight their big fight, and Bahamut and the other gods go to fight 
the uh, Calgary sized jellyfish. Uh, unfortunately for the jellyfish, it's as bad as the hockey team is, and so it loses to all the gods, unfortunately. And we did have this prophecy about like um, the sun would have to, like the sun setting and rising or something on Mount Celestia, which nobody really understood because the sun never sets on Mount Celestia. But of course the jellyfish thing like ends up like flying over and like blocking out the sun and everybody's like, oh, this was that prophecy that, that we heard about like that one time, right? So that was kind of cool. And uh, the parties in, bo oh, sorry. in both cases, of course, are victorious. And uh, they're using like, um, like sending and messaging type spells to communicate across the planes because they know that they need to like both like destroy these things in the same round, right? So like the one party basically like they kill everything and then they've got the, like the one things down to like the last like 30 or 50 hit points. So I, I describe it as being almost dead. And they're like, okay, we gotta wait for the other party. The other party has to catch up. So then that party's on the same place and they're like, okay, we're there. They're like, okay, we're here too. And then, you know, they're like, go. And then they like both manage to destroy the, the artifacts. Then we have, uh, they go to the moon and of course, um, they'd gone to the moon previously because that's where Bahamut, the platinum dragon, who helped them fight this Calgary-sized jellyfish uh, and king of good dragons, was actually imprisoned. And of course, Tiamat, as I mentioned in this White Spire campaign, for those who watched it, the party free Bahamut, Tiamat comes to try to stop them. And in the end, they end up helping Bahamut defeat Tiamat and a bunch of her consorts. And Tiamat gets imprisoned in there instead, right? And the way they got into the Valis Moon was actually through the Dark Reliquary. It had this, like, just something called the Moon Door. And it leads, of course, to the Valis Moon. And, um, of course, it can only lead to the Valis Moon when the Valis Moon is, like, close enough for them to actually reach it, right? So if it's, like, you know, been banished back to the Far Realm or something, then the, the Moon Door does not operate at all, right? But, of course, the Moon God's pre present, so they can reach him. Anyways, so they go through the moon door, they get back to the Valis Moon, they realize, oh yeah, there's the temple, or there's the uh, prison of Tiamat. Uh, don't need that this time. <laughs> so what else is on the moon that we need to find? So of course they end up uh, overcoming a bunch of servants and stuff, and at this point they've got both party members, or both parties with them. Uh, they also have um, the Mouse King with them and Zardat, although those two are very minor at this point. They don't do much. The Mouse King wasn't exactly powerful to begin with. He's very sneaky and stealthy, but his combat damage is like really pretty pathetic, so he wasn't really doing much, but he does lead the party, and he also helped them navigate the maze too. He helps them navigate the labyrinth of uh, Baphomet, and he does it by telepathically communicating with like all the mice and rats and stuff, and uh, using that to like find the way that he needs to go, which was kind of nice, and then he led the party to the center of the maze. But anyways, so he's mostly just there for show at this point, but whatever. Uh, Zardat's there as well. Uh, it's not that Zardat's not quite powerful, but, you know, she... Look, at this point, everybody else in the party's like 19th or 20th level, right? And, you know, Zardat's like 13 or 12 or whatever she is. So, I mean, you know, she's not nothing, but she's nowhere near the same level these other guys are at. And, you know, they've got, like, artifacts and relics at this point. Uh, you know, they... Oh yeah, the Paladin had the Sword of cast. I forgot to mention that, because they used it to help fight Vecna, of course. Uh, but she doesn't really want it, because um, it's evil. <laughs> uh, good for her. So she used it, she tunes to it, so they can fight Vecna, and then just unattune to it after the fight. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, but of course, Shadaza, the Knight of the Dawn, she's got all of her Knight of the Dawn stuff, so she's got her Holy Avenger, she's got, she's got everything. Anyways, they end up fighting... Uh, the moon god, whatever his name is, <laughs> starts with an M, um, and uh, managed to defeat him, and the Valis moon at this point is basically like just a moon, right? Because the moon god itself is dead, so now it's just this asteroid floating through space that just happens to have the prison of Tiamat on it as well, but you know, she'll, she'll, she'll keep guys, don't worry about it. Actually, she probably will, I have no intention of bringing her back. Unless the party does something that's stupid to bring her back, but I'm not going to be doing that. So I don't want to rob the party of their victory. Imprisoning Tiamat was like one of the big epic moments of that last campaign. I don't want to ruin that. So anyways, um, 
Then we have like the big epilogue. Oh yeah, I, I did forget to mention that Ari ended up uh, hooking up with Cole the Bard and with Cole the Bard's simulacrum of Cole the Bard. What can I say? Ari's, Ari's damaged goods. <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention that part of the story. But anyways, um, yes, at the same time. Uh, anyways, uh, so then we have like the epilogues. I kind of ask everybody what they want their characters to do, and most of them like want to go back, like you know, like Crag wants to like try to rebuild his uh, his tribe and stuff, and makes this like he already had a temple to Bahamut, but he wants to like build the religion bigger and stuff like that. You know, uh, Shadazo goes back to uh, now becomes like kind of like the leader of the uh, the temple of a nun. Um, you know, and everybody else kind of does what they want to do. And I'm like, Magnus, what are you going to do? And I'm kind of like, I just start smiling because I'm like, I really hope he doesn't banish everybody else again. But he's like, no, no, don't worry. That's not happening again. A little bit of a lesson. So he does go back to the Citadel of the Dread One. But now all the artifacts are destroyed. It's just, you know, a magical Citadel full of lots of arcane knowledge. Some of which is probably evil, but, you know, whatever. Magnus was evil anyway, so it's fine. And uh, yeah, so everybody kind of goes back to their to their things and does whatever they want to do afterwards. And uh, that was basically the campaign. So uh, as far as like, uh, I think the first half was a lot more rough than the last half. The first half was a lot more like uh, kind of the party members trying to decide what they want to do. It was a lot more sandbox, which is fine, right? I like that kind of stuff. But there were definitely times when the party didn't seem to know where they wanted to go and didn't really have direction from me. But, you know, it all worked out. But I felt like the last half was very, very solid. Uh, my only regret is, like I said, we had several game sessions that were just nothing but combat. And that kind of stuff can work every now and then. But personally, I find like I like a lot of role play and stuff. And I like, you know, letting the players, like, interact with each other and just do their own stuff you know and when your entire game is just nothing but like fighting especially if it's just one giant fight which happened several times right uh that can really bog things down but the players all said they still really liked it they all liked the whole like two fights at the same time type of thing and like i said in my mind it was gonna be a super epic and glorious uh, and it was still kind of that, like I don't want to make it sound like it was terrible or anything, but it was really long and it was just a lot of dice rolling, which was kind of unfortunate. So it was one of these like high concepts with average <laughs> execution at best, at best. But anyway, I thought it was fun. I really liked the idea of these characters going to rescue the previous characters and meeting up and just kind of having that big finale. And I mean, the final fight with the Moon God was was a pretty big fight too. Because don't forget, like I said, at this point we had a ton of player characters. And because Brendan wasn't with us, he was the guy who played Cole the last time. So Megan, who was playing RV the Druid, was playing Cole as well. And then of course, everybody else had their new character from this campaign, plus their old character from the previous campaign. So that's like 10 player characters. Um, this is one of the reasons why Zardad and the Mouse King barely did anything. But I also didn't think it made much sense for them to, like, not help after everything they'd already done with the party. It's like, I guess they'll come with you too, because we might as well see this through to the end. But, you know, they were kind of like bit players at that stage, which is fine. I didn't want the, you know, I don't want the NPCs to be, like, the ones carrying the day at the end, right? We want the player characters to be the ones doing that. But, you know, overall I thought that it was it was pretty good. I think that oh, as an overall score, the White Spire campaign was still better. Although it does kind of end on an aggravating note if you don't follow it up with, you know, Magnus just exiling everybody else, apparently just out of the blue and with the players not knowing where to or how they could ever get back. And so it was nice to have kind of like that resolution to the storyline where now they're able to like bring those characters back. And I did like the aspect of the fact that it's the same game world, but nobody really knew it for the longest time because, you know, I just said it in a different part of that world. They're on a completely different continent. They're not really aware of a lot of those other events. Uh, there were a couple other tie-ins too. Like I mentioned previously about like Jeva Kanor, the leader of the Inverted Pyramid with her glass arm. And then we have uh, uh, you know, Zhao Ling with her glass hand. But that was kind of a more like distant connection. 
I did have somebody who mentioned about how like seven years ago when the Vala, or they didn't say the Vallis moon, they said when the, when the yellow moon appeared in the sky and they talked about it being the sign of ill omen and stuff, right? And, uh, you know, they were afraid of the yellow moon and stuff. And one of the first things that happened in the Weisbar campaign was, of course, the Vallis moon reappears in the sky, you know, and how it's a sign of ill omen. And so I was hoping that maybe they'd make the connection, but maybe it was because of the seven year gap, because the players didn't know it had been a seven year gap, right? I just decided, yeah, I think seven years sounds good, right? So they didn't really catch on to that. But I don't want to be too hard on my players. They did figure out a lot of other stuff. And uh, once they started to figure it out, then they started to see like, oh man, there was like this happened and that happened and stuff, you know? So then they started to piece some of it together. It's just at the time when you're running this kind of stuff, it's really easy to think like, oh, I've got all these connections and the player's gonna see them and they're gonna put all the pieces together and figure out this big mystery. But, you know, you already know what the mystery is because you're the dungeon master. They don't. And they might not even know what's important. Like, I've had times where, you know, the players were investigating like a mystery of something and they spent like 45 minutes on something that was completely not important because that was the detail that really stood out to them. Maybe it was the inflection of my voice or maybe I uh, paused to catch my breath and they thought I was pausing for some sort of dramatic effect or something to emphasize that. So they were off on some red herring that wasn't, wasn't even intended to be a red herring and could totally forgetting what was actually like right there in front of their faces. And that happens sometimes, you know? It's, you know, we're not, we're not all Agatha Christie here. The players are just going by the best they can figure out and you're hoping that you weren't too uh, obtuse with some of your clues, but also not so direct that you're just handing everything to them. And you know, that's where the balancing act comes from, right? But uh, anyways, I thought it was a good campaign. That's why I decided to do a video series about it and just kind of talk about it. Like I said, I realize these aren't exactly my most popular videos, but that's fine. I didn't think they would be. Um, I think it's a lot more interesting to see, you know, if you're interested in a specific character concept you want to play, then it's easy to watch a video on that and see like, hey, I kind of want to do this. Let's see what this guy says. And maybe he likes my ideas or maybe he has something I didn't even think of. You know, that, that's always interesting because you're thinking of playing that thing anyway. And now it's just more information on that. Whereas to listen to somebody else's stories about a D&D game that you weren't even in, obviously that's going to have less satisfaction for a lot of people. But I know there were some people who really enjoyed it. And uh, it's, it's a series that a lot of my players have really enjoyed because it's given them a chance to like reflect back on everything that happened and kind of like relive like, oh yeah, I remember that. Or, oh man, I remember that, you know? And so a lot of that stuff was pretty cool. And I know like uh, for a couple of my like uh, family members, like especially my mom and dad who don't really know much about Under the Dragons and don't play, um, they just like listening to the story because then it's like a coherent story and they can kind of follow it along, right? So no, for them it's been kind of a fun series as well, but unfortunately it's over. Uh, however, the next uh, thing that I try to launch, I'm gonna be doing you know my regular videos, of course, still we're gonna look at multi-class and builds and regular builds and everything else, you know. But um, I'm gonna be trying to do a look at multi-classing tiers, like a tier guide for all the different classes. And so we're basically just gonna look at, like we're just gonna go in alphabetical order. We'll look at Artificer, how good they are at multi-classing overall. We'll look at different combinations with different classes and kind of rate them all. We'll just go through the list. And uh, I don't know, I think it'll be something kind of different. I had a subscriber who asked me to do a tier list on all the like, main classes and all the subclasses, which I think would be really fun and interesting. But it's also been done by a lot of other YouTubers. And I was like, I don't know that I'm really going to have wildly different opinions that is going to really, you know, be something unique and different, right? Um, I mean, you, we all kind of know what classes are really good and which ones aren't. And maybe y'all think that, you know, um, Way of Mercy Monk is better than a lot of other people think it is. Cause personally, I think it's probably the best Monk subclass, to be honest. But, you know, I mean... Whatever, it's, it's not gonna be, it's, it's not gonna be like new ground. I'm not saying that I'll never do something like that. I think it might be in the future at some point. But I think that um, I do a lot of multi-classing stuff. Those are my most popular videos that people watch. And I just thought that doing something similar but with multi-classing would be kind of like more my brand, I guess. So let's just call it, right? And so, you know, that's what we're gonna try to do. I haven't quite determined how I'm going to do it yet. 
I just have the idea that that's what's going to be happening. So it's not going to be starting with my next video. We're going to have a couple more videos looking at uh, clerics so I can finally work my way through the uh, back catalog of cleric subclasses that I've never done videos on yet. And um, But that will be something coming up in the near future. So anyways, that's everything. Uh, thank you for watching. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, of course. And most importantly, leave me your comments in the comments section if you have any criticism, any uh, suggestions, anything you thought was really good, or you're like, man, like I really like the way you did this or this, or hey, you could have tried to do this, it might have helped to streamline the combat a little bit, and I'll be like, ah, darn it, that would have been a great idea, you know? But whatever, like just anything, any feedback is good feedback, in my opinion. So, anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.